name is uh, Marlene Linares Gonzalez, and I'm the Communication and Outreach Coordinator at the Latin American and Iberian Institute at the University of New Mexico, or the LAII as we call it. Uh, the LAII promotes it, uh, and supports interdisciplinary teaching, research, and meaningful public engagement to advance the production and dissemination of knowledge about Latin America and Iberia. Latin America is designated as one of seven priority areas of research for UNM, and we proudly contribute to both the university's intellectual community as well as global discourse through public programming. We'd like to take a moment to recognize the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia on which UNM sits. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of the land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. I'm honored and excited to introduce Dr. Joel Wolf, professor of history at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and alumnus of the Latin American Studies program at UNM. He has published Working Women, Working Men, Sao Paulo and the Rise of Brazil's Industrial Working Class, 1990 to 1955, and Autos, uh, sorry, Autos in Progress, The Brazilian Search for Modernity. He is writing Brazil, an, inc an incomplete nation for po Polity Press and the Global 20s. Joel Wolf graduated from Georgetown University with a BS in Foreign Service in 1982. He moved to Albuquerque to work on Jeff Bingaman's first campaign for the US Senate and to study for an MA in Latin, Latin American Studies at UNM. He wrote his MA thesis on US support for the MNR revolution in Bolivia. He then went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison for his PhD in history. He has held tenure positions at Williams College and Rice University before going to UMass Amherst. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wolf. Thank you so much. It's, uh, I really wish I were in Albuquerque, <laughs> in part because it was snowing here a little bit earlier. Um, I do want to say it's it's really lovely, and, and thank you for inviting me back, at least virtually. Um, I'm a historian uh, in part because of the wonderful experiences I had at UNM. Uh, I went to Georgetown when Jimmy Carter was president, thinking I would come out and join the Foreign Service or do some other federal service. Uh, after all, you know, whatever Carter's warts, you know, the Panama Canal Treaty was signed. Uh, he stood up to torturers. He tried to have decent relations with the Sandinistas. And I came out when Ronald Reagan was president. And so I went I went to work for the Democratic Party. Um, and I thought I'd get an MA and return to Washington and do those sorts of things. And I did that, but I, I was so taken by the history department at the University of New Mexico and, and, and just really loved the people I worked with. Um, and it was very funny that they, you know, the people there all told me that, you know, going to get a PhD, uh, particularly at Wisconsin to work with Tom Skidmore was a great idea, but it was actually Jeff Bingaman. Uh, who knew John Worth at Stanford because John's brother, Tim, had been a classmate at the Stanford Law School and Tim was a senator from Colorado. But Tom Skidmore had been one of his favorite professors at Harvard before Tom left Harvard for Wisconsin. And when I got to Wisconsin, they were joking that I had letters of recommendation from professors at Georgetown, professors at UNM. And I had this letter from a United States senator, you know, that was just, you know, kind of this weird letter that no one had ever seen in a history department because uh, I spent so much time, I was telling you know, earlier, basically driving Jeff around. I mean, I didn't, you know, I was 22. I was just out of college. I didn't know anything. So I was his driver, essentially. Um, but uh, but Jeff really uh, uh, loved uh, Tom Skidmore, and they kept in, in, in close touch. So um, I, I, there are lots of New Mexico connections to, to my career. But right now, you know, I, I, I'm a, I've been a modern Latin Americanist. When I taught at Williams, I taught everything. When I taught at Rice, Pat Seed was there with me, so who's also a Wisconsin person. She's at Irvine now. She was the colonialist and I was the modernist. And I came to Wisconsin and I, I mean, came to uh, Massachusetts, UMass, and I'm the Brazilianist. Um, and it's funny, so I, I feel like, you know, my, my, my focus in teaching has gotten narrower, 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 but my focus in writing has gone and gotten broader and broader and broader. So I wrote about working people in Sao Paulo, and then I wrote about Brazil in the 20th century, and now I'm writing about the Western Hemisphere um, in the 1920s. And this book is an attempt to kind of study an early version of, oh, I just want to I'll share my screen and put my slides up, uh, an early version of globalization. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we get going. Um, so there's my slide and I'll hit play. Um, I've written about a third of the book and it's about all the ways the Western Hemisphere was, and continues to be, but was particularly connected in the 1920s through the movement of goods, through the movement of capital, through the movement of people, the movement of ideas, and interchange of these things. And um, one of the things I, I, I wanna get at is the ways that we traditionally, I mean, here I'm at the Latin American Institute, 
we traditionally um, segregate the study of Latin America from the study of the United States, from the study of Canada. Uh, and yet I think that's a mistake um, that we have, to under, we have to understand the interconnectedness of these places. And we have to think about the Western hemisphere as a region, but also that leads us to kind of question how global history and how globalization works. So why study the Western hemisphere as a coherent unit in the 1920s? And again, academics divided into you know, the US, Latin America, sometimes the Caribbean um, and Canada. And I think there's a lot of chauvinism in those divisions and also a lot of institutional resistance to connecting them. And given the wealth and power of the United States, um, those connections when they're made often focus on the United States. I mean, people say, no, 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 we're connecting them. Look, we're, do we're doing borderlands history. We're doing environmental history. We're doing the history of migration and immigration. Um, but there are few people who talk about those things in a hemispheric context. I have a colleague at Smith College here. I live in Northampton, um, uh, Jennifer Guillermo, who's done amazing work on these um, uh, networks of Italian immigrants who worked in Buenos Aires and Sao Paulo and Chicago and Philadelphia and New York. But that's really rare. People don't do that kind of research. Um, and I, I have a slide up to talk about the chauvinism that we have even at UMass. So, you know, we're a very liberal campus. It's a very liberal state, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, but we now don't have Latin American studies. We have the Latin American studies. We have the Center for Latin America, Caribbean, and Latino studies. And so we've broadened it out, right, to include the Latinx community in our, our center. In fact, we're, we kind of focus more on that these days than, than Latin America um, through a lot of community outreach with growing Latino communities in Holyoke and Springfield, the largest, the fastest growing ethnic group in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is Brazilian. Um, but we don't connect any of it to Canada, which is actually fairly close to us, and I think worth connecting. So to me, when I look at the way the hemisphere actually worked, one of the things I focus on is the question of movement. One of the key themes in the book is movement, the movement of people, ideas, things, and money. And this is an error, right? There's a picture of the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal opens in 1914, but it doesn't really have a lot of tonnage going through it until the 1920s. This is an era of increased automobility. Uh, I wrote a whole book about automobility being important in Brazil. It's a period of the spread of air travel. And, and we all get that, but I don't think scholarship really reflects it. And I had a funny moment. I was giving a talk, a little kind of Brazil colloquium at Glendon, uh, college, which is a kind of liberal arts campus of York University in Toronto. So York is, is like UMass, but bigger, kind of massive cement campus that grew dramatically in the 60s and 70s. And Glendon is this beautiful uh, little place. And the chancellor of, the, the, of York had a, a lunch for us. And he pointed out that we were sitting, uh, Glendon College is built on the old estate of the man who was the principal shareholder, essentially the owner, of, the Sao, of Sao Paulo's primary utility for much of its history. Um, that company, if you know your Brazilian history, is simply known as Leitch now. It was the Sao Paulo Tramway and Power Company, but today it exists as Leitch, right? Um, Leitch Servicios de Electricidade, right? And when I mentioned this to someone at York, when I was on the main campus giving another talk, he gave me one of his students' dissertations on Canadian banking in Cuba. So we all get that that stuff is there, but we don't really make those connections. But we should. There isn't a Latin American historian alive who hasn't talked about sugar. But when we talk about sugar, we talk about sugar in Latin America, we talk about sugar cane. And when we talk about sugar cane, not in Latin America in the hemisphere, we talk about Florida and Louisiana and Texas. There's a suburb of Houston called Sugar Land, right? It was a major sugar producing area. And Hawaii, of course, which eventually becomes a state is also a major sugar producer. And when sugar beets are talked about, it's simply in terms of, well, this was a cheaper way to produce sugar. And certainly during, you know, while Cuba was still had slavery into the mid 1880s, that, you know, sugar beet production was free wage labor and was, was, was more effective. But sugar beets were produced in the upper Midwest and in the Cana on the Canadian plains. The same, and people are more familiar with this, the same is true, of course, of copper. Right? When we think about copper in Latin America or copper in the Western hemisphere, most people say to themselves, probably not in New Mexico, by the way, but most people say to themselves, well, you know, Chile and Peru and Mexico, and of course, New Mexico and Arizona, but also Montana and also Western Canada. The point, and, they, and, and the copper companies 
you know, coordinated labor contracts and screwed over labor by, you know, by, you know, allowing strikes to go on in Chile because they were still producing in Arizona and that sort of thing. And some scholarship notes that, but the structure of the scholarship tends to be that people write about copper in one country and sometimes reference it in other countries. And I'll go into more detail about some of these exchanges and why I think it's important um, to talk about them. So then there's the issue of exactly what is globalization and how on earth can I focus on the 1920s when I talk about it? Now, I always get pushback from my Americanist colleagues because a very simple notion of globalization is starting in the 1870s with more rapid transportation, the broad adoption of the, of the gold standard, that world trade takes off like a, a rocket. And that's true. And then World War, uh, world War I comes and it shuts it down. And it's not really taking off again until uh, after World War II, first with Bretton Woods and kind of slowly, and then the 60s and 70s, and then the era of globalization that people get. You know, the rise in container shipping, the various WTO and GATT rounds and that sort of stuff. But I see uh, globalization in the Western hemisphere is different. And, and one of the things that's so interesting about talking to Americans about this is they all just think this is crazy. And the first thing they point to is the tariff. They say, well, what about the tariff? And when people say the tariff, they're not talking about Smoot-Hawley, which everyone's heard of, right? They're talking about 1943's Ford Nee McCumbler tariff, which was incredibly broad and signaled the return of Republican governance, right, in the 1920s after eight years of, of the Democrats in the White House. But the, but the Ford Nee McCumbler tariff had pretty close to zero impact on the Western Hemisphere. The only tariffs that affected the Western Hemisphere were on sugar, but individual Latin American countries had their own deals, right, sugar quotas that were not affected by the tariff. And the one place it did affect is that there, were, there was winter wheat grown in Western Canada that did face some tariffs. That's it. That's the entire thing. It's really geared, of course, towards Europe. The other issues that American historians always raise is, of course, the famous or infamous Immigration Act of 1924. Now, Latin Americanists and, and U.S. immigration historians know that this had no impact on the hemispheres either, because literally in the congressional debates, the members of Congress from places like Arizona and New Mexico and Texas argued against any limitation on immigration from Latin America. They were mostly talking about Mexico at this time, right? Because they wanted cheap labor, but they couched it in terms of Pan-Americanism. And there were textile interests in New England that also didn't want to limit the ongoing migration of French Canadians into the textile and shoe factories of uh, New England. But in addition to all this, we have to kind of ask ourselves, okay, but how is this global? If you're talking about the Western Hemisphere, how is this global? And on the most basic level, it's important to understand that global history doesn't have to do with the globe, right? And one of the leading historians and thinkers about this is Sebastian Conrad, a German historian. And he wrote in his, what is global history? He wrote, the aim is not to write a total history of the planet. It is often more a matter of writing the history of demarcated, in other words, not global, spaces, but with an awareness of global connections and structural conditions. And, and I think that's a really helpful way of thinking about this. Now, Conrad, who is European, is very much trying to decenter world history, right? It's something Latin Americanists have been doing forever, right? It's just Latin Americans for Latin Americans, whether they're in the hemisphere or in Western Europe or the United States. And he believes, I think correctly, that a global turn is a powerful tool against Eurocentrism or you know, US Eurocentrism. But I think that, that there's another kind of way to think about this, right? Because, you know, people did talk about this in a previous era, when I was an undergrad, not when I was in grad school so much, and that was dependency theory, right? That dependency theory did decenter things, but in a weird way, right? Because it was all about the fact that, you know, in Walter Rodney's famous terms, like how Europe underdeveloped Africa, right? So that's the verb, that, that, that development is something that actively ruins, you know, the global South. And, and, and I... You know, I, I think there's something to that. I mean, I study Sao Paulo, which is a really bad case for de dependistas. Um, but I think that some of the Eurocentrism in kind of early global history has a value. In this case, not Eurocentrism, but putting the United States in the center of this history, because the United States is the most powerful actor and the United States is driving the agenda. I think that's the fairest way of putting it in the 1920s. 
So my claim is that the Western Hemisphere in the 1920s was not just a coherent unit, but really a globalized space that, that reproduced a kind of, uh, kind of what we think of as a global economy, but in with the United States in the middle of it and it being circumscribed. And it's important to think about that. In the 1920s, like there's an argument that World War I was in many ways really a, a war over Africa and Asia and the Middle East, right? That it's a scramble for colonies. And you know, there's uh, just a piece in The Guardian today about how many um, South Asians and Africans uh, fought in World War I. And certainly, you know, we understand the Middle East, you know, the divisions in the Middle East are about the end of World War I, right? So, so the 1920s are about kind of the reordering of these colonial structures. But Latin America, as we all know, is you know, completely free of European colonialism I and mean, formal colonial rule in the 1820s and you know, Cuba in 1898 and I mean, Puerto Rico is you know, part of the United States. And Canada, you know, since 1867 in dominion status, even though it doesn't become truly free until the Treaty of Westminster in 1931, it can make its own trade deals in the 1860s. And it does. I mean, there's a, there's a hilarious moment you know, where, where um, Americans are talking about annexing Canada in the 18, I think, 50s, even before Dominion status. And the Canadians said, we'd love to be part of the United States. You know, we would, of course, be a free state. And the Southerners, of course, point bananas and said, oh, we don't want Canada. So, so Canada had been dealing with the United States and with um, Latin America on its own for a long time. The other important factor is that in the Western Hemisphere, the United States was unbelievably powerful economically and culturally and politically. In fact, the, the argument is it was the most powerful nation in the world by 1920. The United States re emerges from World War I completely unscathed. It quickly became the world's most powerful economy. It had most of the world's gold. European politics in the 1920s strengthened the United States economy. I mean, so when you talk, if you ask someone casually, doesn't do political economy of the interwar years, you know, what was going on in Europe economically in the 20s, you know, they're gonna talk about reparations and all kinds of stuff. And yeah, sure, but what, what you have to understand is that reparations worked to funnel European money to the United States. The entire system of reparations was a way that the United States had financed France and Great Britain and France and Great Britain pay back their loans by sucking the money out of Germany. And American financiers and industrialists through the Dawes plan and later this, the 1924 and 1929 Young plan, they kind of create this system of bringing even more money. So the United States is of course profits immensely from the war itself, but in the 1920s, more and more capital is flowing to the United States. Charles Dawes was a US banker, Owen Young was an American industrialist who was the first uh, CEO of or chairman of the Radio Corporation of America, which would be like being like Apple or Google, right, in the 1920s. And, you know, J.P. Morgan and Thomas Lamont were, were part of the Allied Reparations Committee. The point is that American finance, which is growing exponentially in the 1920s, is, is sucking in the world's money and doing it primarily by taking it from Europe. These mechanisms are engineered by industrialists and bankers from some of the leading sectors in the American economy. And they show really important changes in the United States that, again, I don't think a lot of Latin Americans pay attention to. Before the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, American banks could barely have foreign branches. There are a few here and there it's in Panama because it's kind of a carve out, right? But after the Federal Reserve is created, Americans can bank abroad now. And American, American banks put huge branches uh, all over Latin America and uh, Europe and Asia as well. American consumer goods are, of course, expanding dramatically at this time. And the United States comes to dominate the culture associated with forms of consumption. So Hollywood movies, of course, become uh, the most important sort of movies in the world at this point. I mean, many of us know how the Mexican and Argentine and Brazilian cinemas really suffer at the hands of Hollywood in the 1920s. But radio manufacturers like RCA found networks like NBC, which is founded by RCA, right? And the whole idea is it's a little bit like the internet in the 1990s. That, you know, we, if we can make radios, but if people don't have anything to play on them, no one's going to buy them. And so what do they do? They, they pipe down over telegraph and telephone lines uh, live concerts from New York and Chicago and Los Angeles to Buenos Aires and to Sao Paulo and to Rio and to Lima. Uh, 
Okay. So what about the book itself? I start with a really important paradox about the 1920s, which is that if you looked around the world in 1919 and you said, how are things going? How's capitalism? People would say it's done, it's over. Mexican revolution got rid of free trade. You know, Russian revolution is communism. The flu pandemic, ugh. You know, there are bombings on Wall Street. There are uprisings everywhere. I have an article coming out comparing the general strike of Winni in Winnipeg in 1919 with um, uh, the tragic week in Buenos Aires. And what's amazing is the narrative, by the way, blaming Jews, because shorthand for communists was Jew, because I guess Trotsky, um, you know, that the narrative that elites had of what went on in Winnipeg is the exact same narrative they have for what's going on in Buenos Aires. And there are strikes in Sao Paulo and Seattle and Winnipeg that look a lot like each other. Um, some of you may know that in 1920, there was a very violent, I mean, all bombings are violent, but, but a particularly effective bombing right outside JP Morgan's bank uh, on Wall Street. People were really, really scared that capitalism was done. And, and by the way, and this is something we all get, the pandemic played into that, right? I mean, there's actually, I, I read this stuff before the current pandemic, you know, there's actually pretty good sociological research that one of the reasons the roaring 20s roar is that people want to get back to normal after all of that, right? Uh, the war, revolutions, the bombings. I mean, there's crazy stuff I have in the book. You know, there is a massive explosion of a molasses storage facility in Boston that kills a bunch of people. People are saying, why do we have trade like this? Why do we have such a big molasses? I mean, you know, and, and that's kind of a silly question, but the point is everyone started to kind of turn against these notions of unfettered capitalism and trade. Well, the other end of the 1920s is of course the Great Depression. I don't even put many slides up about that. You know, the bonus marchers on DC should, should you know, tell you all you need to know. And you know, the 1930s were themselves a complicated time, right? I mean, the, the economies of the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany grew at a much faster rate than the United States, Great Britain, or France. So it's easy to say that the 1920s roared and it was an extraordinary decade of economic growth and innovation. Right, but the question is like, well, what does it represent? I'll tell you what I think it represents. It's the high point of traditional liberalism. And in fact, the argument of the book is like, stop talking about neoliberalism until you understand paleoliberalism. And this is what paleoliberalism looked like. And my God, you know, it, it's really familiar. Okay, it's really, really familiar with less technology. But. So the book has a series of chapters that are not exhaustive or encyclopedic. My editor refers to it as a thought piece or a series of thought piece. And after setting the scene of you know, what went on here, I kind of moved to the first chapter, which is about movement. And I start with Charles Lindbergh. I mean, Lindbergh, you know, of course, flew to Paris and then he flew around the United States. But then he was invited by Dwight Morrow, the Morgan banker, who's the US ambassador to Mexico, whose daughter, you know, was a Smith grad, right down my block. Um, he, you know, Ann Morrow Lindbergh, he marries, he meets her in Mexico. And you know, Lindbergh's travels in Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean are incredibly important. Uh, they're covered uh, front page news that Charles Lindbergh was there. Uh, I continue uh, after looking at Lindbergh uh, while studying all the ways movement and transportation were revolutionized in this time by analyzing road building and automobile exports and the operation of the Panama Canal, the building of national airlines, the rubber industry, the oil industry, which is of course incredibly important. In fact, the international market for oil, a lot of people don't realize this, the United States was by far the world's largest oil producer. In 1920, Mexico was second. The Mexican oil industry kind of falls apart in the 20s. And by the end of the 20s, Venezuela is the second largest oil producer in the world. I also, in terms of movement, I look at migration. I study the great migration in the United States and the development of the Mexican-American population, not just in Southern California, but in Milwaukee and Chicago and Detroit. And this was part of the tremendous growth of cities at this time. You know, the rise of Miami from a mangrove swamp to the hottest housing market in the 1920s is an example of that. It's an example of the growth and changes in the Western Hemisphere. And there's all kinds of movement from the Pampas to Buenos Aires, from the Brazilian interior to Sao Paulo. And we have the broad urbanization and suburbanization of Montreal, Toronto, and the Canadian West. So that brings me to my next chapter, which is about housing. And the home, I actually start with Fordlandia, which I wrote about in my Cars book, right? I mean, in Fordlandia, as you can see from this picture, and there are a lot of great pictures in the Henry Ford uh, archive in Dearborn, 
um, was set up to be a kind of idealized North American city. And I compare that with urbanization and suburbanization throughout the hemisphere, the rise of new forms of transportation and the ways auto companies promoted the idea of the nuclear family with a freestanding home and a garage and a driveway and all that. Housing booms in almost every country demanded what? Increased copper for plumbing and electricity. You know, increased, uh, you know, in Portuguese, right, electrodomesticos, right? You know, uh, you know, like refrigerators. I mean, there were ice boxes then and that sort of stuff, right? Radios. And those, those are big, you know, big, those big console radios. I even draw really, I think, interesting co uh, co comparisons between New York and the 20s and Sao Paulo. That midtown Manhattan grows up in the 1920s. I mean, you can see that with Rockefeller Center. And then, of course, the Centro in Sao Paulo. But you also have the development of kind of garden communities in Queens, you know, where people have a car and that sort of thing, and the Jardines in Sao Paulo. And these are very much going on at the same time. And I connect that to a culture of domesticity, and which, you know, made its way from the United States and Canada to Latin America. And we see that in all kinds of things, including the movies. And, you know, some of the biggest stars of the 1920s are from Canada and Latin America, right? Dolores Del Rio. Uh, I mean, I could... Uh, you know, a lot of Canadian ones, but I thought you used Dolores Del Rio since I'm a Latin American. You know, as a Hollywood star in the 20s and 30s, and she was Mexican, born and raised. And, you know, she was a big deal. I think it's hilarious that one of her biggest movies was about going to Rio when she's Mexican. But, you know, she helped promote, as you can see from the picture, you know, the so-called modern girl or modern woman that was very tied up. And there's great research on this. By the way, the book is, you know, 90% based on secondary sources, right? Um, there's great work on all these things. Um, and, you know, so it was about promoting, you know, cosmetics and a U.S. style meals were promoted with, you know, imported coffee and bananas and sugar and cereal it was all kind of, you know, sold through what? Through the growing presence of American owned, American directed advertising companies that are opening offices throughout Latin America that are advertising on radio uh, that are driving of course, automobile sales and movie tickets. Globalization also played out, the next chapter is on diversions, right? Sports and entertainment and criminality. The, the most fun I have is talking about prohibition. Um, but this chapter analyzes Hollywood and the transnational music industry, and it also looks at sports. So if you know a little bit about Argentine history, I'm not a boxing fan. I have a colleague who's written a lot about theater pool. Um, you know, but... Uh, in 1923, Luis Angel Firpo knocked out Jack Dempsey. This was a big deal, not just in Latin America, but in like international boxing circles. But you know, I actually, third little secret, I started doing this at Rice when I was a college master, is I teach the, the most popular general, general education class here at the University of, Mex uh, University of Massachusetts, and that's the history of baseball. And you know, baseball plays a big role in all of this, right? I mean, the Great Migration, which is part of the movement in the United States, which is a little earlier, but it's accelerated during the 1920s, leads to the establishment of massive, you know, African-American populations in upper Midwestern and East Coast cities. Black people are forbidden from playing Major League Baseball until 1947. And we have the rise of the Negro Leagues, the Homestead Grays, who were from uh, Pittsburgh, right? But there is a connection. The Negro Leagues became an incredibly important transnational network for Caribbean and Mexican players moving into the U.S. North. Latin American players um, uh, played in the Negro Leagues, except there were some you know, very white-skinned Cubans who played in the, in the major leagues. And Negro Leaguers toured, they barnstormed, right, in the Dominican Republic and in Cuba and in Mexico. And in fact, when, um, I see my daughter is calling out there, when, um, uh, when Jackie Robinson comes to the major leagues, the Dodgers have to do their spring training in Cuba, right, uh, because, you know, Florida is still you know, obviously deeply segregated. Um, so this is a part of kind of the way sports and entertainment culture are increasingly transnational, related to the great migration in the United States is the rise of Harlem and the Harlem Renaissance. And you cannot, you know, talk about um, the music and the art in Harlem without reference to what's going on in the Caribbean and the incredible ties uh, between um, African-Americans and, and Cubans, particularly Afro-Cubans, but, but you know, Cubans and Dominicans and other and Puerto Ricans, others in the Caribbean. So entertainment through music and movies and sport was increasingly transnational in the hemisphere. The funniest example is of course hockey. The NHL is created as an openly transnational league because you have teams in Canada and teams uh, in the United States.
The other thing that was really fascinating was studying prohibition. So when I started thinking about prohibition, I thought like, I told you that, well, you know, winter wheat was, you know, prohibited and oh, did that affect, you know, Canada's trade balance? No, Canada ran a huge trade surplus with the United States because, you know, it was exporting illegally, um, legally made spirits and beer, right? So in fact, there were, there were pipelines and pipelines that went under the Detroit River. Uh, and, you know, I kind of started thinking about this because when you read the press reports of bootleggers and gangsters, it's the exact same language and the exact same fear mongering, but now about Italians and Jews that we hear about Mexicans and Colombians in the drug war, right? Starting in the 1990s and, and continuing to the present. So prohibition is about a lot of things, right? I mean, you know, uh, you know there's a very good book about you know people going to Tijuana, we know about people going to 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 Cuba, and one of the things I did not know about was booze tourism. It was a thing, uh, particularly here in the Northeast. I mean, I know I'm you no, know, the roads are better today than they used to be, you know, but I'm about four hours from Montreal today, uh, and a lot of people uh, drove up to Canada to drink, and the Canadians were very torn about this. I mean, a bunch of loud American drunken Americans, you know, but people spending a, a ton of money um, in there. So you have booze tourism, you have the rise of international transnational criminal organizations. The next chapter um, is about how this was all paid for. Oh, I don't want to go there yet. <laughs> um, I don't have a good picture for you know how international gold transactions took place. I mean, there's a funny story. Lots of U.S. gold was at Fort Knox, but most gold in the world was at the Bank of uh, Bank of England in kind of the third basement down. And they literally, rather than shipping it, right, because that's friction. Um, the kind of Bitcoin of the day was they would simply go down to the basement and move bricks from like the French pile to the English pile or the German pile to the English pile, and they had little flags of them. Um, but, but it is important to get that this is an era of the rise of kind of finance and American tinkering in finance that we associate with the IMF and all kinds of nonsense today. It was the rise of the money doctors uh, who went down to Latin America telling regimes they could not be reformists because they were running budget deficits and they had to fix that. I'm not gonna bore you with more of that. The, the, the next chapter and the final substantive chapter is on the backlash. And this is really became really interesting to me watching Brexit and watching uh, Donald Trump. The reactions to this intensified integration were, were pretty intense. Um, and in fact, I, I conclude the book with a study of a kind of like, what does this all mean for you know, the future of the global economy, blah, blah, blah. But given the current state of, of US and British politics, I think it's worthwhile to look at this backlash a little bit more. And some of it is really familiar to us. The obvious form is the Ku Klux Klan, which in the 20s, you know, is revived, is, you know, marching. The guys don't have hoods in front of their faces, right? In Washington, I, I grew up in the Philadelphia suburbs and, and I know in a very Italian Jewish area and a couple of my friends whose families, Italian American, I, I'm Jewish, but Italian American families who've been in there forever talked about, you know, that their grandfathers tell stories about trying to figure out who was who when they marched by their shoes, you know, going to the Klan marches. Didn't that in suburban Philadelphia, in Philadelphia, there were Klan marches. But now we know that in 1927, Fred Trump, father of Donald Trump, was arrested in Queens at a, uh, it's in the New York Times from 1927, um, in a, a Klan uh, rally. So the Klan is in the upper Midwest. It's in Canada. I mean, I just found that out recently, that it grew in Canada. Um, and it is opposing, we think of the Klan, rightfully, in terms of white supremacy and anti-Black um, politics and, and anti-voting rights politics. But, but the two things, the, actually, not the two things. The one thing the Klan was most obsessed by in the North at this time is that they were anti-Catholic, right? And they couldn't stand that, you know, a Catholic had run for president, right, Al Smith, um, on the Democratic ticket. And it's important to remember that not restricting immigration from Canada and Mexico had increased the Catholic populations. Now, now, New England has a large Catholic population in and around Boston and, and Worcester and Providence and Hartford. But, but, you know, lots of smaller towns were getting massive French Canadian populations. And as I pointed out, the existing Eastern and Southern European Catholic populations in the upper Midwest are growing with the presence of Mexicans. Right? And it's not like they weren't still anti-Black and anti-Jewish. So the Klan is anti-immigration, right? And it doesn't want to have all those folks that the 1924 Act lets in. Um, it's important to get that there were Klansmen on the 
left, right, and center, right? Uh, and they were all over here. They are in Binghamton, New York, right? America first, right? I mean, that people kind of unthinkingly say America first is kind of a clarion call for improving college education in the United States, uh, high school education, excuse me. Um, but this issue of, of Catholicism is really important for politics, right? I mean, I always tell my students, it's really weird that we've only had, you know, Catholics are the uh, largest single religious group in America. And until Joe Biden was elected president, we had had one Catholic president. And he was, and no offense, you know, I live in Massachusetts, he was a very waspy guy, going to prep school, going to Harvard, his dad was a billionaire, right? That's John Kennedy. Um, so, so Catholics are an extraordinarily important political group. And in fact, it affects politics in the 1920s. Republican presidents Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge were very, very active in um, demanding that the government in Mexico um, stop fighting uh, the Cristeros, um, not because they were pro-Catholic, neither one was, you know, but because they didn't want to alienate Catholic voters in the United States. What's interesting about the Cristero rebellion is that, as many of you probably know, it was a Catholic, conservative Catholic opposition to the secular nature of the education programs put in by Vasconcelos and others, right, you know, in, in Jalisco and Michoacan. But what a lot of people don't know, and there's, there's actually terrific uh, uh, French-Canadian historian, Maurice de Meuse, who's written that, the, that there were incredible connections between those right-wing priests in Jalisco and Michoacan and right-wing priests in Quebec who are rejecting the increasing secularization of life in Montreal. I mean, Montreal's the most important city in Canada until the 1970s, uh, and are rejecting a, a lot of this kind of Montreal group of writers who are very forward thinking and that sort of thing. Um, and so we see transnational connections that are rejections of the modernity being pushed you know, by uh, the Bronfmans and others in Montreal, right? The founders of Seagram's, the big, you know, big distiller there in Montreal at this time and certainly against the program of the Mexican Revolution. Of course, there were similar, um, similar issues on the left. Uh, I think one of the funniest things, and actually John Coatsworth, if some of you know who John Coatsworth is, he's retired now. He's actually Tom Skidmore's first graduate student. Um, you know, Tom told me, I mean, John told me one of the funniest things is the operation of the CPUSA, the Communist Party of the United States of America. The CPUSA, the common turn, was part of the common turn, had as its goal to you know, spread revolution and protect the Soviet Union. And it was organized you know, to fight American and to a lesser degree British imperialism in the Western Hemisphere, but it was organized that its headquarters were in Harlem, it would receive orders from Moscow, and the CPUSA in New York would telegraph those orders down, you know, so fight imperialism by taking orders from a foreign government via offices in New York, right? Um, but having said that, and I'm not a fan of the way the communists behaved in Brazil. They were really bad for labor and kind of bad for the society for many years. But, you know, that the Communist Party, the Catholic Church is the first transnational institution in the history of the world, right? And the Communist Party is sort of the second really big, truly transnational institution, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of years later, right? Um, but it is a transnational form of rejecting this capitalist integration that's going on. More importantly for Latin America, we have things like um, the anti-US kind of coalition that builds around uh, the occupation of uh, Nicaragua uh, and the war against that uh, by uh, Sandino. And what was fascinating is reading the, the Nicaraguan newspapers, those are the primary sources, right? Reading the Nicaraguan newspapers on one side of the page, you have you know thousands come out to cheer you know, Lindbergh landing and then reports about you know, how many Marines were killed by Sandino. And actually, you know, some of the press kind of like Sandino, right? Um, if they're part of, you know, the liberal party and that sort of thing. Um, and we know there's very good work that the opposition to the United States in Haiti and the Dominican Republic and Nicaragua is a rejection of this, you know, and it's stuff that's gone on forever, right? The Pan American Union, the US is there for, for a long time, but that it's all intensified in the 1920s. And all those forms of mobility, right? All those forms of communication mean that they're now also being used for the backlash, for the opposition uh, to all of this. And there are, of course, you know, um, more, and so obviously, right, you all know who Sandino was. I have this slide when I give this talk to people who do global history who don't know um, who he was. But, but there's also really interesting stuff going on out of Peru. Uh, and, you know, most of you know who Victor Ayala de la Torre was. He was a reformist politician 
but he, his whole kind of um, policies of opera, right, were pan Latin American, right? He founds the party in Mexico City. He's openly talking about Argentina, and you know, I mean, he's he's in politics in in Peru into the 1970s, but he's very much a, a part of kind of a Latin American, maybe for the first time, from Latin America. I mean, most of you know this. When you go to Brazil or Argentina or Peru, no one teaches Latin American history unless they have a PhD from Great Britain or the United States. Right? They teach Peruvian history and Argentine history and, and, and Brazilian history. And here's Victor Ayer de, de la Torre and another um, uh, great Peruvian, well, I don't know, Ayer was a great thinker, but Mariataki was a great thinker. And his seven interpretive essays in Peruvian reality talk about things like the internationalization of the Panama Canal. Um, uh, Puerto Rico as an independent nation, that a Peruvian is talking this way uh, in um, 1928 is important. And part of the reason to understand this is who the president of Peru was at this time, and that's Leguia, right? So there's Leguia on the left and I on the right. Leguia is a fascinating figure. You know, he's president of Peru for a long time, but after being in the War of the Pacific, he moves to New York City and he's an insurance executive. And he comes back to Peru incredibly wealthy, and that's how he gets into politics. But bringing this kind of conceit of, of kind of modern US, you know, insurance companies or finance companies, right? Finance to the Peruvian reality, right? Um, I guess we'll see where I am on slides. So, you know, but these things take all kinds of, of forms. And, you know, the one that I know the best, I mean, I could learn a lot about Peruvian history, which is a lot of fun, and probably went to Peru. and. A great time, but of course, in Brazil, there are two uprisings that on their face are not anti American or anti British. The Tenentes, right? The young military men, the lieutenants, right? Uh, first at uh, Copacabana in 1922 and in Sao Paulo in 1924. But what they're objecting to is they're saying Brazil is not a, is not a country, essentially. I mean, it's not at all a, 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 an integrated, uh, independent country because all it is is an export platform for coffee. And the terms of trade of this liberal economy has diminished Brazil. And the Brazilian military has been talking about this since the Paraguayan War, right, in, in, in the 1870s. Uh, and and my, my, my graduate school friend, who's now the president of Kent State, Todd Dykin's book, both on the Comte de Estado and his book on um, Rondon, going to the interior of Brazil, were all about the military kind of saying like, oh my God, you know, like this is not really a coherent country. And when I was reading the Ministry of Labor archives in the 1930s and 40s, People in Rio would talk about something happening anywhere else in Brazil, Sao Paulo, Salvador de Bahia, as interior, because there was just no sense that Brazil was a coherent place. And um, they had uh, these, the Tenentes lose, but they become incredibly important figures in the dictatorship of Getulio Vargas. And some of them go on and their ideas are very much uh, in the 1964 to 85 military dictatorship. And that's why that dictatorship, which starts out as kind of hyper-liberal becomes developmentalist by about 1968. Uh, for, so from so 64 to 68, yeah, it's very liberal. I mean, liberal, economically liberal, um, free trade and so forth. Uh, but by 68, 68 to 85, it's developmentalist um, because it harkens back to these questions. And I always point out that, you know, the Republic is founded in 1889, the military founded, and, you know, the national slogan is order and progress, right? I mean, it's about having a strong state to have economic development. So, Historians haven't really looked, there's some exceptions at this backlash in the 1920s. Um, they've looked at Mexico as the example of this, but I think it's really important. And, and when I teach Central American history, when I teach US and Latin America, I bring up this article. Now, a lot of people don't know who Walter Lippmann was. Walter, we have no equivalent of Walter Lippmann today. Walter Lippmann was a bona fide intellectual who also had a you know, widely read a column. He wrote a lot of books. He started as a socialist. He becomes what you'd probably call a neocon today. Um, when Walter Lippmann started telling LBJ it was time to get out of Vietnam, LBJ, like that happened. And then Walter Cronkite, and you know, this shit hit the fan. But what's fascinating is in 1927, in foreign affairs, which is like the Bible of US foreign policy, right? Like George Kennan's uh, uh, containment policy is, is written in foreign affairs, signed by X, right? Um, he warns US policymakers that they are looking at all the stuff I'm talking about, this backlash, and they're thinking that it's radical politics. They're thinking that it's communist. This essay, Vested Rights and Nationalism in, in, in Latin America, is, is very prescient. Because what he says is, if the United States misreads Latin American politics, which it does from this time into the, into the, into the, into the, into the present, uh, 
that it's, it's, it's lost. He concluded with a warning that any attempt to protect US interests, right, US business, against, quote, against social progress as the Latin American peoples conceive it, unquote, would be disastrous for the entire hemisphere. So he gets that. Okay, so I'm almost where I wanna finish. So let me just do some qu very quick conclusions. I'm trying to connect the hemisphere and at some level both decenter things, but also show that the United States is the 300 pound gorilla in all this. And I think that that simply reflects how the system of global capitalism that the United States was experimenting with in the 1920s would come to play out in the post-war period until today. I mean, if you start, if you, I do not read Chinese, but if you read the Chinese press, I mean, this is what they're saying, that that, that, that period is now done, right? And that, you know, the sun now revolves around China, but that the United States created this system and that what, what was going on in the hemisphere in the 1920s is really just a dress rehearsal for, you know, the 1945 to say, I don't know when, 2008 period. And I think connecting the histories of Latin America, the, you know, Canada and the United States in this period makes a lot of sense because these countries were in fact connected. That's how things actually operated. And I think academic divisions where, you know, American historians don't read a lick of Spanish or Portuguese or French, so they can't read Canadian and Latin American history, you know, plays into it. But I also think, as I said, it's important to understand this era as a dry run for the sort of U.S. sponsored and dominated global trading system put in place um, after World War II, which essentially became uh, the, the system that we now call modern globalization. All right, I'll end there. I'm happy, to, I'm happy to answer any questions. That's obviously a ton, covered a ton of ground. Um, and one of my favorite things about these things is when people say stuff to me like, did you know X? Like I gave this talk, a similar talk, uh, right before the pandemic in Edinburgh, Scotland at the Global History Seminar. And a couple of people there kept asking me about, about Brazil's role in the League of Nations. Because, um, you know, that would challenge the US-centric part of it. And it turns out the, the Brazil did play a role in the League of Nations, but it was in the 1930s, uh, not so much in the 20s. Um, but anyway, so I'm happy to answer questions and take corrections if I got something wrong. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Wolf. If you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself, Luis. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, and, and uh, thank you, Joel, for, for the talk. I, I actually teach at the history department, so it's, it's great to hear that, um, that you have these this very strong connections to, uh, to New Mexico and to our department. I mean, it was a fascinating talk uh, and I'm really looking forward to uh, reading your book and, and using it for my classes. Uh, I, I, I do teach, I, I do teach a, a class on inter-American relations that tries to kind of get at the, at the global right context of inter-American relations. Uh, so thank you for that, for working on this. Uh, I mean, I guess two, two things and, and one is, uh, definitely more a comment and, and kind of a, a, a something that 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 really struck me and that I'm glad that you're uh, in, incorporating is the sort of the hemispheric character of, of Catholicism and of Catholic networks, no? Uh, because uh, we tend to think Latin American is we tend to think of the Catholic Church as sort of right the the um, conservative institution by by definition, which to some extent it is. Uh, but uh, particularly, I mean, when we look at, at conservative Catholics and also radical or leftist Catholics, we see these, these networks really explode, no? And, and the example of Quebec is super interesting, right? The Universite, Université Laval, right? Yeah. And I, I have found even, uh, for instance, in my own work about um, right-wing Catholics in Argentina, how there is a strong connection, right? And, and very important uh, uh, sort of lay Catholic intellectuals that were also political activists on the extreme far right have this training in Quebec, right? Uh, and, but also the, 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 the leftists, right? So, so it's this, this, even these spaces and these networks are not exclusive to only the, only the right or only the left, no? So it's, it's such a fascinating uh, aspect that, and I'm, that I'm glad that you're incorporating. And then here's a, a, I guess a question, and maybe it's related to, to what you were just mentioning briefly at the very end. Well, at the beginning and at the very end, which is uh, sort of this idea of decentering uh, hemispheric and global history, 
right? And I'm thinking of the work of, of, uh, of the recent book by Christy Thornton, who wrote about sort of the, the, the very important and she would argue central role that Mexico played in right, global um, economic governance. So, so what's, I mean, I'm just wondering about the, if you could say just a little bit more about, um, about what your argument is in terms of the role of the United States, because there seems to be an argument nowadays about um, is this, what does it mean to decenter the US if we keep coming back to its centrality? Yeah. Right. Uh, and we keep referring yeah. to it as, as kind of the, you know, it's the main power. We cannot deny that. But then right. how does that power get made in, in the interaction right. with other parts of the Americas, for instance? Right. Great comments and great question. I just, I, you know, I, I think the issue of, of, of conservative Catholicism and then that kind of elides into evangelicals. Ben Cowan is a good friend of mine who's ah, right. a Brazilian historian at UCSD. I think his new book is out. I read it for, for his promotion to full professor. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's on the kind of ties of the right wing evangelicals in the United States to, nice. to right wing, not just evangelicals, but also the right wing church. You know, if you know the case mm -hmm. of Brazil a little bit, we, oh, and this is Ben's point, we always look at Cardinal Arns and we look at Frei Beto and others who were liberation theologians. But his argument is the majority of the clergy is deeply right wing and deeply complicit with the military. Uh, and I think that's really true. Um, you're asking, like, I think just a, a truly brilliant question, and it does come up. I, too, teach um, inter-American relations. And, oh, and one more thing about, about American politics in the church. When I talk about um, the Salvadoran Civil War, I mean, one of the things that's so interesting is that uh, Duarte and Ungo, uh, who win the election in 72, are jailed and, and being beaten to death. And it's Theodore Hesper, right? The, the president of, uh, of Notre Dame, who's probably the most important Catholic in America in the 1970s, uh, who goes to Nixon and says, you're up for re-election. <laughs> you know, you know, do you really want every, you know, every, uh, you know, priest in America talking about this? And Nixon leans on the, the military in El Salvador to release them, right? I mean, simply because of Hesburgh. And when you look at what, uh, what Harding and Coolidge did with the Cristeros, it's purely for political reasons, right? So it's, it's fascinating. But I think that the, the, the kind of intellectual and methodological question you ask is, is fantastic. And, and I, you know, it's, I, we're all in this thing where it's like most of my books are here that I'm using, but I have to go to my office every so often. And, you know, um, but I have a, on my shelf, I have, you know, Amy Offer's book, uh, Christy Thornton's book, and Tor Olson. I don't know if you know Tor Olson's book. He was a UMass undergrad. Um, Tor, Tor is the one that goes the earliest because he shows all these Americans who were in Mexico in the 20s who then bring agricultural policy ideas to the New Deal, right? Including people like Frank Tannenbaum. I had no idea. Um, that some of these figures were there. So I like all those books. I do think that 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 Offner and Thornton are talking about uh, post-1945. Um, I, I think it's really tricky because, I, because as I write, I keep finding myself writing about the United States as this giant force, you know, the elephant in the room. Uh, um, I forget if it was Porfirio Diaz or Lopez Portillo, I can't remember who, you know, said that, you know, bordering the United States is like sleeping next to an elephant, right? That, that'll especially, you know, you're safe until they roll over. And that's my image of the United States in the 1920s. But, but I think that the backlash, and I'll give you another classic example. So I've been teaching modern Latin America, this survey, of modern Latin America, since my last year in grad school. And, and the question I, I tell my students at the beginning of it, Here's the final exam question. <laughs> you know, does it make more sense to talk about Latin America as a unified region or as a bunch of different countries? And I show them a picture of an Andean village and then I show them an airplane factory in Brazil. I said, are these the same thing? You know, like if you tell an Argentine that they're non-Western, they'll look at you like you're nuts. How is that someone in Buenos Aires non-Western, right? Um, but it's a debate and what is it? And, and what I find so interesting is like starting in the twenties, particularly around Sandino, um, that Latin Americans start to define themselves as Latin American. You know, uh, you know, at least Caribbean, and then you know, with Mariataki and and I, and, and so, you know, the United States is just there, and it's so damn powerful. And this is, as I said, it's a dress rehearsal for what goes on in World War II and in the Cold War. But what those scholars you're you're mentioning are talking about, and by the way, I have a graduate student working on public housing in the Northeast of Brazil, and the and you know, well, actually from the dawn of public housing through the through the dictatorship, but particularly the Alliance for Progress is that you know, technocrats and people who actually make policy are very aware of what's going on in Latin America and are shaping it. So there is more of a dialogue and a dialectic. I just find as I write, 
and it might be my sources. But as I write, I just find the United States is just so dominant economically and culturally. And having written the book about cars, you know, what's clear is that, that and Brazil's its own case, right? It's just such a unique place. But Brazilians are totally happy to copy things that are American and then make them Brazilian. And there's a, a historian of technology who calls this multi-local. And, you know, like when you go to McDonald's in Brazil, right? I mean, I've been to McDonald's in Brazil, and you say to people in the McDonald's, like, is this an American corporation? And they'll kind of be like, well, we know it's from America, but we've made it Brazilian. You know, like the meat is better. They're not wrong. It's Brazilian beef, right? We have maracujá juice, you know, we have this stuff. And, and I think that, so unlike Mexico, which, you know, obviously has issues with the United States, Brazilians and, and I think, you know, Argentines and Chileans and Peruvians are willing to kind of deal with these things and make them their own. But I do, I am enduringly impressed and fascinated by people whose work is showing me how much American policymakers are influenced by Latin American policy. I don't think it goes on in the 20s, because most, with the exception of Mexico, most Latin American states are pretty weak and don't, don't have a lot of policy. But, but you know, Thorne's book's are really good. And so is Amy Offers, right? And, and Tor Olson's. They're, they're fantastic books. That, it, so that, that question, by the way, um, Luis, you know, occupies me as I write. Right, excellent. I'm, I'm glad to hear because I again I'm really looking forward to, to reading to reading the book and to see how 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 it how you kind of deal with that. Uh, I don't know yeah. with that with those tensions, no, between decentering and but then going back to the center and that dialogue between the supposed center and the supposed periphery. You know? But thank yeah, you, thank you for. Was, yeah, mm -hmm. the other thing is that you know there's there's not a lot of there's not a lot of space between like capital and the state. I mean, you know, you know, the U.S. government is is just doing what Wall Street wants it to do in Latin America in the 1920s. It's, you know, the industrials don't really ask for much, right? Yeah, you know, but, well, but that's not true. There's like whole Herbert Hoover is a big actor in this because he creates the modern Commerce Department and they create huge divisions to drive exports, to help to open markets, to learn languages, how to advertise in Latin America rather than just like translate an ad that you used in, in the United States. Um, so there is, there, and then, you know, you get the rise of the kind of Latin American expert, right? And that they're, that they're foreign service officers and, and Ford Motor Company always had as its view that it was a transnational corporation. And so you actually have a Swede running um, for do Brazil for many years, but then you have Brazilians up in Dearborn and Brazilians in South Africa. And, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Hopefully I can answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Hello everyone. Um, Dr. Wolf, thanks for sharing your work with us. Uh, fascinating. I'm a, uh, a student of the twenties and thirties as well um, oh. from Europe. Um, and I sort of had a similar question to uh, Dr. Iran Avila about the 300 pound gorilla in the room, which he said was the United States, obviously. I wanted to ask you about, um, do you mention somewhere in the book about sort of the US gaze is certainly towards Europe during the great war. And it will be again, certainly after 1933, right? Um, is part of the argument the fact that uh, the Western hemisphere is sort of on its own during the twenties, is this part of what you're, are, are, you, are you arguing that this creates some space for, for us to interpret uh, this region in a different way? And, and if that's the case, is it not sort of true then that the, the other uh, behemoth in the room is, is still Europe? Um, and, and also, before I forget, I, I do want to say this is a uh, do you know X comment um, because you showed us the famous uh, Bellows portrait of Luis Furpo knocking Dempsey out of the ring. I did want to I did want to clarify that Dempsey did return to the ring and win that fight. He knocked. Uh, he did. Oh, you knocked him out, and then he goes, okay. So I'm not a I'm not a boxing guy. Yeah. No, take it um, take it from me. I'm a. Anyway, anyway, okay, I, I appreciate that. It's a. It's a great question, Carter, that you're asking, and and um, and and the thing is, if if you know, you're a historian, what what country do you work on in Europe? Sorry, uh, uh, Spain, but uh, oh, okay, Europe generally, and I'm uh, definitely a like a, a cultural and and intellectual historian. I'm a doctoral candidate, not a professor. 
Right. But these are my... Well, you might know the work of my, my colleague, Brian Bunk, who's the one who, um, I do. you know, who, who, who wrote some stuff about Firpo and has a book coming out this summer in Illinois Press about global soccer, a, a really terrific book. Um, you're asking a great question. And, and, and so what, what I'm saying in the book is in part, the United States is not isolationist. And, and just because the Senate won't, won't ratify the League of Nations, it's not isolationist. But what it does do is it looks, looks first and foremost at Latin America and secondarily at, at Asia, right? The United States is always very interested in Asia uh, in terms of trade. But what you must know, although I don't think it's so much the case in Spain, but American, you know, in American capital and American corporations are huge in Europe in the 1920s, right? Ford and GM expand, right? GM buys Opal, I think, at this time. Um, IBM, you know, which is kind of growing as a company is going to, you know, we know because they get tied up with Hitler. Um, and, and also, you know, we know that everyone from, you know, you know, from, uh, you know, Gramsci to, uh, you know, to Hitler, you know, are, they're all fascinated by Henry Ford. And Hitler's fascination has something to do with Ford's anti-Semitism, but, but they're fascinated with American industrial production and, and, and American as a industrial. So, the, so it, and as I said, you know, U, U.S. finance is huge in Europe. Um, and you, you know tons more about Spain than I do. Um, although Tom Skidmore's office was next door to Stanley Payne's at the University of Wisconsin, uh, who was uh, behind his back known as the Guernica Professor of History by many of the graduates. Um, but, but, you know, but Spain, you know, loom large, you know, to American conservatives and American liberals. I mean, we always think about, you know, Hemingway and others and, you know, uh, the left. But, you know, William F. Buckley, the, the right wing, kind of one of the godfathers of the current conservative movement, his father made money by selling, you know, who had lost his oil fields in Mexico to Cardenas eventually, but he sold oil uh, to, uh, to Franco and he broke the, the embargo. Um, so I stood, so, so yeah, I don't want to kind of, you know, do the thing like, oh, it's so Latin American centric that yes, Europe doesn't exist. Europe is still a market. Um, the Ford Lee, Mc, Ford Lee McCumner, McCumley tariff um, is aimed at Europe. Um, it's just my kind of argument is that real free trade can operate in Latin America because none of the Latin American countries are part of the European countries anymore. Um, that's that's what I'm talking about, and that the United States can really turbocharge everything in Latin America where it does it can't do that in Europe. Um, it's just you know there's too much going on in Europe, and, you know, that, and and there's like lots of the Europeans keep popping up. So for example, a lot of people don't realize, this, but since the United States built and owned the Panama Canal. U.S. flag shipping got a steep discount, and so the Europeans complained bitterly um, to, Ho to Hoover uh, about the fact that they that you know Hoover was killing European trade in the west coast of Latin America because the Panama Canal was prohibitively expensive for European shippers. And I'm, I read a bunch of letters from Peugeot and other um, manufacturers to Hoover as well about how the United States was destroying the French automobile industry and the European automobile industry. They couldn't uh, they couldn't export to Latin America. That was a little different. That's just the Americans were cheaper producers, right? But but Europe is still there. Yeah, I would never want to pretend that Europe's not there. It's just I think what's on and, and also geopolitically, Europe's on everyone's mind a lot more than Latin America. There's no question about that. Um, Latin America is still completely taken for granted geopolitically. It's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? No. Well, thank you for coming out. I mean, you're all stayed in. Is, 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 do you guys have any live classes at UNM? There's a few. Yeah. I don't know what the percentage is, but they're, they're doing a couple of, uh, not very many though. It's, it's primary. We have some labs essentially, and, and it's mostly labs. We have a very fine music school. They're, they're doing some stuff. We, we have a, the, the hardest program to get in at UMass is nursing. Our nursing students are brilliant. And we have an excellent, uh, I know you have med school, our med school is in Worcester. Um, and we have an excellent public health school. And so we have great testing uh, and actually the vaccine clinic, my entire family has been vaccinated uh, on campus. We have an excellent, it's, it's, um, it's better than the state system, it's separate, it's the UMass system of vaccination. But still, and we have students on campus, but m almost all of our classes are by Zoom. Yeah. So, and, and Carter, are you doing grad seminars by Zoom? 
Uh, no, I'm on a research trip that's just going on for years and years because I can't actually go anywhere and do research. So I'm, I'm uh, calling in from Portland, Oregon today. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I have these two Brazilian grad students and, and they have the same thing. People say, but they're in Brazil. And I say, yeah, but the archives and libraries in Brazil are closed too. And, and right. Brazil's, I mean, you know, second only to India in terms of bad management of the, of the, the pandemic. Um, so yeah, so it's one thing to not be taking class and be doing research, but even if you were in, you know, Madrid, probably you couldn't do much. No, so, not yet. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Good luck. It looks like we, had, we have a question in the chat. Any historically informed predictions about our post-pandemic 2020s? Yeah, but so I, I mentioned my PhD advisor who was a very wise man and he used to, and he worked on 20th century politics and he actually made some pretty decent predictions. But he would always preface it by saying that historians are prophets of the past. So, you know, we're frequently wrong. But there is actually some pretty decent sociological and historical research on attitudes. You know, there's a very sharp, brief depression in 1921 into 1922 because of the retract, contraction of the economy after the war. Um, and after that, and after the kind of full recovery from the pandemic, people went crazy. And so mass gatherings, you know, you know, filled in movie theaters and uh, and the old Madison Square Garden and you know and and, and things like that. And people wanted to be around people. Um, and of course, there was no, you know, there was no Zoom. You know, the telephones were limited. Um, but but I do think that the best um, the best prediction is that at some point people will feel safe. And that a lot of people, particularly because we have this kind of hyper Keynesian intervention by the Democrats, um, which I think is brilliant and good. Um, you know, people are gonna have money in their pocket and hopefully a lot of small businesses will have survived. And I think people are gonna wanna go. I have a former student from Amherst College because they, they, they take classes that I would, did his, his senior thesis, so baseball. And he's now in the pro scouting department of the Mets. And you know, he formally invited me down for a tour of everything. And then he said, how's July 22 looking? You know? <laughs> and I think that, like we all just kind of assume that like this summer is gonna be better than last summer, but maybe normal will be uh, in 22, which is kind of tracks the 1920s. By 22, 23, things were, were taking off. Um, the one thing I, I will tell you, you know, a lot of people don't realize we talk about the Great Depression, commodity prices peaked in 1927. Right? There were a lot of alarm bells about capitalism. Uh, and so that's the other thing to keep an eye on. And when we look at, I don't know about commodity prices, when we look at asset prices and so forth, um, you can't predict what's going to happen by looking at the 1920s, but you can, you can learn to be scared of certain things or hopeful about certain things in terms of um, sociability and that kind of thing. Well, thanks again for the invitation. And to, to those of you who came out, thank you very much. It's, it's fun. I would have much preferred to go to Albuquerque. I, I've always, I always liked New Mexico a lot, uh, particularly coming from the East Coast. It was, uh, it was just so interesting and wonderful and different in, and different, you know, 99 out of 100 times in very good ways. Um, and, and I've always missed it. Um, my, my only connection to it was when I worked for Bingham in Washington a little bit, a lot of New Mexicans came in. Um, he had, I'll just leave you this one last story. He had this giant blow up of the Ansel Adams a photograph of moon over Hachita, New Mexico. You've probably all seen this. And, uh, and Ansel Adams saw that he was doing some lobbying for the Sierra Club or something. And he sent one of the originals to the office. And it wasn't for Bingham, it went to the state of New Mexico. And he was back visiting the Senator and I was staring at the photo. And I hear this voice say, well, what are you looking at? I said, it's just so crystal clear. How did he get it so crystal clear? And Ansel Adams said, well, I'll tell you what I did. <laughs> and what it is, is, is he told me that the negative is the size of the print. It was, it was whatever, you know, eight by 10 negative. And he sat there at night and he said it was like a 45 minute exposure, you know, and he had to be completely still and that kind of, so that was, yeah, I'm back to New Mexico. Uh, that was my last kind of contact with the state. Um, and and I, I, I promise to say hello if I get out there when life returns to normal, uh, because you know one kid's out of college, another kid's in college, so we, my wife and I can kind of go where we want to go now, which is fun. So. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely, we owe you we owe you a trip out here. Uh, we would have loved to host you at the LAII, but but next time. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wolf, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. And thank um, you. Have, have, a, have a good day. Stay safe.